Okay, we uh, we took a break. Uh, we're now back on YouTube uh, streaming. Uh, it's Wednesday, April 14th. This is the House Healthcare Committee. Uh, we had just completed hearing from a witness, uh, Dr. Uh, Robin, uh, and we had interrupted our testimony with Deputy Commissioner Morty Fox. And I'd like to return to that. I think we were at the point of, um, I think we had gone through sections one through four, am I correct? Yes. Yes. So let's, let's, um, yeah, so let's, let's turn to section five and six. And um, again, can we turn it over to you to share comments, Deputy Commissioner? Sure. Um, I, I, I don't think I'll kind of read through the, the sections. No, I don't uh, think you need to. I think just make comments as you wish. Yep. Um, you know, as, as far as section five, the assessment of mental health services uh, within corrections, uh, you know, we're in support of that, that, uh, that section and the work to be done there. Uh, as Commissioner Baker and myself have testified uh, in other committees, uh, we do uh, request some additional time uh, for for that uh, study, uh, wow. in order for it to be uh, as robust as possible, uh, in uh, you know if if uh, the legislative session uh, were to end in uh, you know May, let's say we're really looking at about four or five months uh, uh, time frame uh, to get that done, uh, which is possible, but it's just it's a little tight uh, uh, in in doing that. Uh, but I think it's an important uh, piece to make sure that we're really looking at what are the actual types uh, of services, not only available within corrections, but also in the community, uh, the timelines and uh, for access to those uh, services uh, and how, the, how those compare. Uh, also knowing that uh, uh, Department of Corrections has a new healthcare provider in the past year. Uh, and the impact that uh, having a new healthcare provider has had on any of the services uh, being provided uh, within corrections. Um, so, and do you have a suggestion in, in terms of extending that time? What Commissioner Baker had asked in uh, House Corrections and Institutions uh, was for uh, a year from this date, basically. Uh, so looking at sometime mid-session uh, next year. Uh, um, uh, 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 thus allowing still getting that report into the legislature, but still having some time to be able to address those findings. Um, okay. So, yeah. Okay, can I ask a question on this? Because this inventory uh, touches on a number of issues. W what is the relationship of the Department of Mental Health with the provision of mental health services in the Department of Corrections? I would say it's a committed relationship. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, all, all joking aside, uh, right. we have a very strong relationship uh, with Department of Corrections. Uh, we have very frequent uh, conversations, you know, uh, case by case, where Department of Corrections will. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I should realize that I want to I reframe my question slightly, actually. So finish your, finish your comment, and then I, then I want to, yeah. So, so basically, you know, we have we have a lot of conversation, case by case conversations, uh, where they see consultation uh, for individuals that are uh, within the Department of Corrections custody. Uh, we uh, also will uh, work with them uh, should an, a incarcerated individual, whether they be a detainee or someone serving a sentence, uh, um, should they there be a question as to do they uh, need hospitalization will not only consult uh, with that, but also then help facilitate those admissions um, as needed. Uh, we also train uh, the staff, uh, the clinical staff uh, uh, who work uh, at, with the contractor to be uh, uh, qualified mental health professionals uh, so that they have the ability in-house to be able to uh, begin the process for emergency exams uh, should that be needed. In the past, uh, they had not been. Um, and about two years ago, we began that process. Uh, and partly 
uh, because of helping to increase the, the time frame and access uh, to hospitals or hospitalization for individuals who may require involuntary hospitalization. In the past, what would be required is that if Department of Corrections felt that they had a uh, incarcerated individual who met that criteria, they would have to contact a local designated agency who would then have to coordinate coming into the facility uh, to do an assessment. Uh, and that's all valuable time uh, that, that one is waiting for that assessment to determine if they need uh, that level of care. Uh, so that's another piece that, that we have done. Um, and so that's you know the, the major tenants of, of it, but you know, our care management team uh, regularly consults with uh, both the uh, healthcare provider uh, as well as DOC uh, staff uh, in regards to you know, cases and case by case uh, uh, situations. Okay. And so, what, what the further question that as you were talking, I, it occurred to me is that uh, what is the, so there's a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Mental Health and, and the Department of Corrections, and that's a public document, I assume. Uh, could you share that with us just so that at some point, you know, some, someone sure. might be interested in seeing that. Um, but my question, does the memorandum of understanding address your relationship? Do you have any oversight relationship of the contractor who provides health services to the Department of Corrections? That's, that's really in part my question. Yeah, no, because, we do not. Because all of, because isn't it fair to, isn't it accurate that the health and mental health services other than stepping out into involuntary commitment or uh, evaluations for that actually are provided on a contractual basis with a vendor. Uh, am I, I'm, that yeah. is my understanding. Is that your, is that your, is that accurate? Yes, yeah, so all those services, both health and mental health services uh, are provided by a contracted vendor. Uh, when, uh, the Department of Corrections uh, put out their RFP and uh, eventually uh, contracted with a new vendor. Uh, the Department of Mental Health was a part of the review committee um, and interview committee uh, for that uh, RFP response and, and uh, in the decision making around uh, the, the contractor. Um, uh, and, you know, in fact, you know, that was part of my role uh, was doing that work with with uh, my partners at DOC to give our input uh, from the mental health lens uh, to the contractor's ability, uh, history, uh, services, et cetera, uh, of what they could be providing uh, to incarcerated individuals. But, but we the, have no direct oversight. But there's no direct oversight from the Vermont Department of Mental Health to that contractor in the way that there is for the community system. Correct. Where you have a you have direct oversight responsibilities for quality of care and provision of services in throughout all counties of Vermont. Right, and I think the, you know, part of that is through through our master agreements with the designated agencies uh, that we're able to uh, uh, right. ensure that that type of oversight. Whereas we're not a part of that agreement with uh, the correctional healthcare provider. Has that been ever been contemplated that the Department of Mental Health would have a direct responsibility uh, and role with the provision of those mental health and health services, well, in this case, mental health services to those Vermonters who at that point in time are in the correctional system? In my tenure, it hasn't really been contemplated as something that we were looking to take on. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's an, it's a, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think at the Department of Mental Health, we're concerned about mental health treatment for all Vermonters, as, as you're mentioning. Uh, and so we want to be involved and that's why we requested to be a part of the RFP uh, process uh, and why we fully supported uh, working with DOC and creating the uh, memorandum of, of understanding. Uh, um, I, I, I guess it would, it, would be, it would be something that I think we would have to explore to see what that would look like, what, and, and the legalities and, and all those types of pieces of how we could have uh, more oversight if it were to be decided to do that. Right. You know, I, I just, it occurs to me that I might want to include something to do an evaluation of that as part of this work group's work or something to that effect. It just, it, do, it does, it's anyway, it, just, it occurs to me as we're talking about. Sure. I, and we wouldn't there, be opposed. There may be, other, there may be other ideas that come forward. I don't know. 
Sure, and and you know, at least sitting here in this moment, uh, we wouldn't be opposed to to that being a part of the study uh, to take a look at. But as I said, Department of Mental Health is and should be concerned, you know, with mental health treatment for all Vermonters. That is our charge, at least how I see it. Right. right. Okay, uh, Representative Peterson. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank oh, on you. The, on uh, this particular issue, and yeah, this this section five. Yep. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, so, so understanding this, then, and and uh, uh, Rep. Lippert, I'm glad you brought that up. That that's an important thing about the contractor. Um, so, the contractor is dealing with those those folks in the mental health uh, unit that that are in corrections, and and you folks are dealing with folks that aren't in corrections but are in the mental health institution is that correct is that how that so you could literally be you know have somebody come from somewhere whoever's contract I'm, I'm not i don't mean to denigrate them i mean they're a contractor who who qualified to do the work but they're in the same building hospital if you will facility that you are you are providing civilians they're providing people that are incarcerated or, or are ready to stand trial. Is that is that how that works? I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Um, the, the contractor for the Department of Corrections provides mental health services for all individuals within Department of Corrections, um, period, w whether they're in a mental health unit or, or not. Um, and DMH has oversight of mental health services in the communities and with our designated hospital. Okay, so I'm misunderstanding. I'm misunderstanding. So the, the contractor is providing mental health services for the employees of the Department of Correction. All, all the, the incarcerated inmates. Uh, incarcerated inmates. Right. So can I just step in? Because I think maybe you're talking across. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I am. <laughs> okay. But I think so. I think maybe the question that I hear Representative Peterson asking is Are there persons who come from the criminal justice system into a like uh, into the, uh, the, the facility in Berlin or other facilities uh, who are, are, they, are they ever under the Department of Corrections uh, responsibility when they're also in a facility? run and licensed by the Department of Mental Health. And what, where does the contractor's responsibility fall in all that? I don't know if that's part of the question, Representative Peterson, but I- I, I, I guess, I, I just, I, it didn't occur to me that our, our state employee people, mental health experts, psychiatrists, are working side by sides in some instances, I think, or well, maybe well, not, in. not. Actually, I don't think they are. They're That's not. Oh, okay, uh, no. then I'm way off. Okay. No, but but if someone is in a correctional facility and they are receiving mental health services as an inmate in one of the correctional facilities, that is provided by the contractor for the Department of Corrections. Gotcha. But that's why I was asking. But I was asking: Are those provision of those services, and is that contractor under oversight by the Department of Mental Health? And what I'm hearing is that no, they're not. That contractor operates independently of the Department of Mental Health. And I, I at least wanted to raise the question about: Should there be some role for the Department of Mental Health in an ongoing way, not just for selecting the contractor, but for ensuring that the services are appropriate? Et cetera, right. and are consistent with what the state's criteria are. Yeah. And, I, and I'll add one other piece to that is that, again, most, I think, based on all the testimony we've heard for years, most of the services provided in Vermont for mental health services are provided by nonprofit providers. My understanding is that if I believe, I don't know, can't speak to the current, but many of the contractors who have been contracted with are for profit. Providers. Now, if I'm wrong on that, I'd like to be corrected about that as well. Do you know if the current provider of health care, including mental health care to the Department of Corrections, is a for profit provider or a non profit provider? I don't believe that they are a non profit uh, entity. I that means wouldn't they're a for profit. myself on that, but I, I don't think I don't think they're a non profit, so right. i.e. profit. 
Right. So I, I, I again, for me, it raises a question of the, the, whether the standard of care is the same when you're contracting with a for-profit healthcare provider as opposed to a non-profit healthcare provider. So again, I, I personally would like that to be part of the questions that are asked as we look at the relationships here. Yeah. And, and there may not, there, I'm not drawing a conclusion, but I think it needs to be asked mm -hmm. uh, because we're also, we, we, we're facing those issues, frankly, in the Department of Corrections in terms of use of for-profit correctional facilities right. out of state uh, as well. And, and there are implications. Right. There can be implications. And it would be my hope that, um, that the study, which is looking to compare really what the services types, uh, availability, access, et cetera, within Department of Corrections and how that compares to what's in the community. And as you mentioned, Chair Lippert, what's in the community, a large portion of that is by nonprofit agencies. Uh, and so having that comparison will be uh, enlightening, um, I think. I think so. so I think, yeah. Um, Representative, uh, Representative Page, I think, and then Representative Donahue. Uh, yes, Chair, and I think you raised this as well. The services that are provided, mental health services in our correctional department, are they the same elsewhere, uh, outside of the state? And I think you briefly touched upon this. Oh, well, that's a, that, that, that adds a whole other layer of question. Absolutely. I think that's, yeah, I think that, I don't think that's articulated here, but I think that's a very important question that should be, yes. Was, was the question, uh, just because, uh, Sorry, Representative Page, it was just a little quiet on my end. Was the question, are the, the services within Department of Corrections the same as outside of the Department of Corrections within Vermont? No. No, no. it was, are the services that are provided, mental health services to our individuals incarcerated in Vermont, are those services the same or equal or even better outside uh, uh, of the state for those that are incarcerated outside of the state. Not compared to other corrections. Yeah. 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 That's a really good question. Yeah, and uh, again, Woody, I'm, I just made a note. I'd like to think about incorporating that into the, into the evaluation there. Thank you. Representative Donahue. Yeah, thank you. The, the one uh, concern I've had about the language and I'd love your insights on it, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, the, the implication seems to be we want to compare these because what's in corrections ought to meet the standard of what we offer in the community. And if, it, if that's the approach that this would be what we want to see as a standard of care, we know, for example, that at times there are long waiting lists in the community to access mental health care. So is your understanding that the assumption built into this is that we are looking to the community as we ought to be doing as well in corrections and that what's in the community therefore is an appropriate standard? Because that my concern is when, where we know there are gaps in the community, I'm not sure if we want to then say that's the ideal system, that's the right standard of care and therefore we should equal it. And if you only have to wait four months in the community, then waiting four months in corrections is good also. Right. Um, I think, I think your, your assessment, Representative Donahue, is, is pretty accurate. Um, as far as how I read that section, it really is looking at a comparison uh, of what happens within the walls, if you will, of Department of Corrections versus what happens in the community. And I think one could make the assumption then that what, what is, available or current practice or current norms in the community is best practice. Uh, and, you know, I, I agree with you that I don't think the, I don't think the, I don't think the intent of the, for us in, in doing a review, the intent is not to say, well, since you might have to wait four months to see a psychiatrist in, in the community, we're good because it only takes two months you know, within corrections or something of that sort. Uh, you know, I think I think there will be parts that will show that there 
there may be, you know, quicker access uh, within corrections than there is in the community. Um, and I think that will be enlightening. Um, but I think, you know, if we want to really look at it uh, and I think we should look at the, what are our best practices and norms and what are, you know, recommendations from organizations like SAMHSA and, and others as far as timeliness and access uh, to services and not just um, what the current uh, state of affairs are out in the community. Right, and I'm thinking on all of these, perhaps we can come up with some language that articulates some of the, incorporates some of these, these questions further. Other questions or other, other any other comments from Deputy from Fox on this? So let's turn to section six. So my testimony prior and again today uh, on this section is that we have tremendous support uh, for the need for this uh, uh, forensic care working group. Uh, there's a lot of issues that, that need to be discussed and, we, and need to be uh, uh, sussed out uh, for what Vermont needs, what our gaps are, um, and uh, uh, how we can mitigate those and, and really create a, a, uh, uh, an impactful movement in our system of care in general. Um, the looking at gaps, competency restoration models, et cetera, um, I think are uh, incredibly important pieces. As Dr. Rabin mentioned, you know, having a formal competency restoration program uh, in other states has shown that uh, anywhere between 60 to 80% of individuals who have been found not competent to stand trial uh, can be restored to competency. And for me, I see this as a civil rights issue um, and not just uh, a, a criminal justice issue um, in that we have a person who is being told they're incompetent to stand trial for an alleged offense um, and they're not convicted of it. They haven't been proven that they've done it. And I really truly believe they have a right to face their accuser. They have a right to formulate a defense. Um, and uh, I really see it as a civil rights issue for individuals to be able to be found competent, to be able to put on their own defense, whether it's a sanity defense or not, uh, and, and to move forward and have, have that case formally adjudicated. Uh, I think that also uh, is something that's extremely important for uh, uh, victims uh, of, of offenses. To have it, there's always going to be that question uh, of, uh, is this the, per you know, those type, there are some circumstances where I think it's clear people really kind of know, you know, gosh, there's so many witnesses, you know, those types of things of an event. However, it's not always that clear. And I really think that it's a civil rights issue that uh, individuals have the right to be able to formulate that defense. Um, and so having a formal competency restoration program, uh, both in, in the community as well as within our hospitals, uh, is an important step for us to move forward on. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Representative Peterson uh, had brought up the question about people trying to game the system. Uh, and such like that during during assessments. And, and I think that's part of competency restoration programs, but also just looking at our system in general uh, and looking at uh, folks. And I agree with Dr. Ravin that it's not the most common of occurrences, but it does happen. Uh, and you know, there's specific types of psychological testing uh, that can help kind of delineate and, and show whether or not someone is, is trying to, as, as resident Peterson said, game the system, um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, so I think there's a lot of, a lot of pieces here that, that we are important for us to look at. Um, I, I have heard some testimony, uh, from others, uh, during this, that, uh, having language in the, in the, uh, work group that mentions things like looking at psychiatric security review boards or the Connecticut Psychiatric Review Board, uh, 
could be too prescriptive or uh, leading folks in a direction. And the department has no problem with that language being taken out, taken out of the bill. I think we need to look at all types of, of systems. And uh, I, I personally would not want uh, anyone to think that uh, it was biased uh, one way or the other going into it. Uh, I think this is a really important work and uh, it needs to be crafted in such a fashion that we're really trying to mitigate anyone's concerns uh, that something might be too prescriptive or trying to lead something in one direction or another. Similarly with the language of uh, uh, the need for a forensic treatment facility. Uh, you know, that language, uh, I've heard some folks bring up that that kind of implies that we need it. Um, and I think that it's important for us, you know, similar to my language that I suggested for the ONH part in the study committee, if we need such a facility, uh, you know, those types of language changes, uh, we would definitely support. Uh, not looking to make this prescriptive. Uh, I know, and the, and the department knows, a lot of the different areas that we want to study and, and to look at. But I think Dr. Rabin makes a great point about um, being able to contract with and bring in regional or national experts that can help us really take a look at this and not just rely on, you know, maybe my own personal expertise in this, in this field um, or, you know, Dr. Rabin's, uh, but others as well uh, who are outside of this. Uh, and, you know, and so I think those pieces are very important for us to, to really consider as we, as we go forward with this. Um, can, I, can, can I just interrupt you on that point? Because sure. it was a question I, I did want to just very directly ask, because I, I actually, in reading the language, shared some of the same concerns that there, there's, there, that there, one could read that there's already a conclusion that there should be such a facility. And, and the question is what kind of building should it be in and how many beds there should be in. And, and I, I frankly am unclear whether there has been a conclusion drawn that there should be such a separate facility and whether the Department of Mental Health has drawn such a conclusion at this point in time. I think, I think our opinion is that, that there there likely is that need, but I, I personally, and as a representative of the department are open to having this discussion to really just have other people's input as well as, like I said, having other experts weigh in on this and take a look at our, our system of care here and how we can do this best for Vermonters. Uh, you know, I think from my experience of the, the, the trials and tribulations of trying to manage criminally justice involved individuals uh, who have significant public safety concerns being placed in psychiatric hospitals as incompetent to stand trial without the ability to really uh, have them restored to competency. Our goal is really to treat the individual. And so my concern comes out of a place of we have an individual who's been hospitalized, who is needed to be hospitalized. They're incompetent to stand trial. We treat them. That is what we do in the Department of Mental Health is treat people's illnesses. And now they no longer need to be in the hospital. And now what? Yeah. That's, that's the issue for me. Uh, our psychiatrists at, at the hospitals cannot call the court and say, we think they're now competent, so get a new evaluation. The court will say, that's nice. Um, and really, you know, it's up to, you know, defense and state and other folks to make that decision. Uh, we don't have that capacity to kind of say, this person's now competent. Um, and, you know, that the doctor is saying, they're treated, they're now competent, this needs to be, you know, reassessed and, and further discussion needs to be decided as to where this person should go. If we, since we can't do that, we treat them we cannot keep them at a hospital for just public safety reasons. Uh, that's what puts our, our federal funding at risk, uh, that they made the, that CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that is the majority of the funding for the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital can come back in and say, 
we're not going to pay for the time that that individual is there or even decide to say that we're not going to pay for that facility because you're you're keeping people there for public safety reasons not for treatment reasons and so those these, are some the, of the so these problems. are some of the complexities that really deserve a thorough right investigation a thorough study with some recommendations for improvements or changes as necessary and i i guess i want to just say that i I, I want to. I, I share your earlier comment that there not be a perception that this this study is already has has already drawn its conclusions before it's taken place. Uh, so I think, and I, I'm I'm just again I'm speaking for myself, having having been part of dealing with some of these directly and indirectly for years in the legislature. I think it is time for us to have a thorough understanding of these issues and with some recommendations. But I'm concerned that we not prejudge yeah. the outcome uh, and then therefore once again feel like the evaluation the the study or the evaluation uh, didn't serve its purpose right and I also think that's why too on this section um, similar to dr. Raven I really think we need more time than November 1st uh, to to do this 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 the study to include looking at competency restoration programs, assessing all the gaps in our system. Should we or should we not have a facility? And then if that's a yes, all the other pieces underneath that of how it should run, who should run it, uh, how many beds, all those kind of questions uh, on top of looking at the ONH notification piece and if that should be in included in a bill and if so, how. These are a lot of pieces and, you know, if the committee wants a report just for a report's sake, then November 1st will be fine. It's actually August, uh, August 1st. It's actually an August 1st date for this report. Well, it's not, I believe oh, no, it's that's August 1st I apologize, start. I apologize, I apologize. No, no, yeah. I'm confusing dates. Yes, you're right. But still, on Thank August you. 1st to November 1st, that gives us, you know, three right. months uh, to try and, you know, do something that really is, is, is a large lift. But like I said before, I am passionate about how important this is. There are civil rights issues that we're talking about here uh, for, for individuals and, an, and a potential impact to our entire system, both mental health and correctional. Uh, and so if we're going to do this, we need the time and some of the resources to bring in other experts to really have a thorough evaluation of these needs and the gaps uh, so that we can come back with a healthy and robust report and with recommendations that are clear for this and other committees to consider. And if I may, uh, Dr. Robin also mentioned resources. I, I don't believe there are any resources set aside specifically for this at this time. Is that right? Not that I'm aware of at this time, no. And, and the Department of Mental Health is being asked to convene this group. Correct. Um, and I assume that means to staff this group. Correct. So I, I guess- We I'll... would love to have some uh, funding to help resource this, uh, not only uh, our staff time, uh, but also like, like myself and Dr. Robin have both testified to the importance of bringing in either regional or national experts to really uh, enhance uh, and enrich this, this conversation. Uh, I can't think of a more important conversation that, that we're having right now than, you know, there's so many civil rights issues that we're, we're, we're dealing with today. And this is one of them that seems to sometimes fall to the bottom of the ladder as far as public awareness goes. And I think it's really important that we do this justice. I'm not going to put you on the spot for it's right now, but I would ask if you would bring back to us uh, some thoughts on a recommendation for resources that you believe would be sufficient to appropriately allow this to provide the thorough evaluation that you're referencing. I, I can get that recommendation to you probably around the same time I can get you the uh, copy of the MOU uh, as well, the Memorandum of Understanding. Okay. So, um, fairly short turnaround. Yeah, so we have some other questions. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of our time, but I think we're doing pretty good. I think I'd like to keep moving, but let's hear the questions. And then I think we cut you off. I cut you off by asking a question earlier, but uh, but I think it's, frankly, it's valuable to hear your responses to that. So Representative Peterson and Representative Donahue. I, I have to uh, step I'll let, out. I'll let Ann go first. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I have to step out in a few minutes. So if I can. 
just jump in. And also, were you referencing the MOU with corrections? In getting that, just, that's, yeah. that's what I asked about. Yes, we, we that's posted. Yeah, we have. Okay. We had asked for that. And we received it. We didn't yeah. receive the attachments that it references, but um, so we, we do still need those. Um, so, I, I mean, I while I was waiting to ask my question, a lot of it was sort of laid on the table. Um, I strongly agree with how important this is. I've been actually trying to bring bills to have this happen for a number of years now um, with really digging into these issues. Um, my concern that I want to articulate um, for the deputy commissioner's response, um, we actually had a, uh, a similar, similarly constructed study group in 2018 that focused solely on the issue of ONHs, the orders of non-hospitalizations, and actually had a smaller number of uh, stakeholders and had more time to complete its work. Um, the subject was really massive. There was no, uh, easy consensus. Um, and the end result of, um, of the scope of the task, um, et cetera, was that, uh, that the report was uh, not useful, I think, and did not ever see any action in the legislature. And I actually asked to have it posted in case people want to take a look at what the outcome of setting up something like that. So I look at this, and it's similar question to what I asked uh, Dr. Raven earlier. I, there are at least six different, very substantial issues I would suggest that any one of those six, an entire work group could spend a year really understanding the issues and actually bringing forth as is requested by its proposed language for statutory revisions. Um, and there's a really big number of people um, who all have you know, different interests and different parts of it and some, some strong opinions on different parts. And it's there's a lot of people around the table, which always makes conversations take longer. Um, and a lot of them there have specific interests, but not necessarily uh, expertise. There are a lot of different models around the country. I think the work in terms of um, expertise and uh, identifying different models itself is a separate piece of work that really would need to take place before a group started hearing. So my question is, do you think that it's remotely feasible or productive, not that I wanna stack the question, that it's remotely feasible or productive to have this many complicated, critically important topics all as part of the scope of a work group of this size uh, weighing in, in terms of uh, actually coming out with a useful set of recommendations uh, and language for the legislature to look, like, look at next year. I would say I share your concerns. Um, you know, it's a, it can, when you start getting a group this large um, with, as you say, uh, varied uh, interests, but not necessarily expertise. Um, it's akin to herding cats, um, and we're already on a short time frame. Uh, I also would agree that any one of these topics uh, could be a six month or more uh, study uh, to do it any kind of justice. Um, I'm, I'm open to conversation about how to structure that. Uh, whether it's staggered um, in, in how each section is, is looked at. Uh, I think it also would make sense to look at the, the listed members um, as a part of this and in which part of, of these should they actually be represented at. Uh, uh, you know, I think like the discussion of should we even have a forensic facility no offense to my counterparts at BGS, that's not an area that they need to be involved in. Um, you know, things like that. You know, we need to to really kind of look at um, 
who the members are and in in which area they're they're participating uh, and whether that's done more organically if you will um, after it's set and we decide okay we have a year to do this and if DMH is kind of facilitating this that we're able to say these are the folks that should be in this conversation these are the folks that should be in that conversation something like that or whether it's more prescriptive uh, in in the legislature in the legislation uh, I'd be open to that conversation because uh, I, I I share that concern representative Donahue uh, knowing that uh, this is a complex not no this isn't a complex issue these are complex issues um, you know each and every one of them uh, and you know so so I think that's that's what we need to look at and I think there's areas here that we're still you know you know I can add to this um, you know where you know the the adjudication of not not guilty by reason of sanity or incompetence and trial the language is you know due to a mental disease or defect and that's not always mental health. Um, and, you know, there's really no conversation here about how this impacts Dale and their system of care uh, and, and their involvement. Um, and, you know, so I think, you know, we need to, there are those pieces as well that, that concern me uh, in trying to get this work done. Um, but I, I, can, I can give you my assurance that, my own personal assurance that this is something that I'm passionate about and want to make happen uh, and want and I want and feel that this is something that needs to be useful. Uh, the, a, a report of this nature that will come back to the to this committee and others that will be anything but prescriptive and recommendations and and strong voice of of what Vermont needs will be less than helpful. And it'll be a waste of a lot of people's time, energy, and money, uh, to be honest. Um, so, but I don't have a quick answer as to how, how to, to fix that. Oh. Well, I think you've made a number, if I may, you made a number of comments, which I think, you know, at some point, this committee is going to have further committee discussion. And I've been making some notes here of things that we might integrate or change or modify some language. and. Uh, I think they're, you know, frankly, it, it is our task. We're being asked to uh, help uh, identify and then make recommendations for how this, this might be modified. Uh, so it does fall to us to come up with some, some type of proposal. Uh, and, um, I, you know, I think that's going to be a, a next step once we have also opportunity for some more committee discussion as well. But I think we've been, I think we've been el eliciting suggestions throughout as we've as you've testified and as questions have been asked of yourself and uh dr robin and, and perhaps others that's uh, but we do also have a time frame in which to get a proposal uh which for us is at the very latest by the end of the week uh so we have we have things in front of us uh representative you step out i will be back um hopefully okay. quickly yeah. yeah okay thank you Further comments, uh, I'm trying to think where we were. Well, I think I think part of the, you've spoken to in part, the issue of actually having the ability to actually evaluate whether a forensic facility is is the appropriate thing. And then, and then you maybe have indirectly talked about, I mean, you talked about sequential, I mean, if it is, then th that's when it would be appropriate to, to look at some of the other issues uh, rather than to uh, step into it immediately. Uh, are, are there other? I take that as similar to the earlier part in the bill where uh, if a defendant is found competent, then assess for sanity. If we decide that there's a need for a facility, then let's talk about what it looks like, who runs it, how, you know, all that type of stuff. Right. And or fiscal impacts. Yes. Because there will be. Right. Other comments, because I think we've, I think you've touched on really most parts of sections five and six at this point. Are there other comments that you'd like to make just generally at this point? And 
And I really appreciate the amount of time you've taken with us and uh, fielding questions from folks. No, I, I appreciate the time. I, I will do this all day long and all week long. Uh, um, okay. If asked, but I, I testified on this when not asked to testify in this in <laughs> other times. Uh, well, I, might, I might just questions. mention. I might just mention that we may be returning to this this afternoon after the floor. So, uh, to the degree <laughs> you might take a look at your schedule this afternoon, it might actually, <laughs> frankly, be useful to have you available to be a resource. Um, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Um, We're and uh, sure. I know that. Uh, Representative Black had asked a question about, uh, you know, this kind of being more of a response uh, to to some things, um, and I think that's why I also brought up, you know, I think we need to really be be careful about how we look at stuff. So, so first of all, you know, I, I don't see it as a response. I think it it does respond. I don't see it as a response, particularly because some of this bill, you know, really, you know, started over, well over a year ago or two years ago. Um, but the reality is um, that I think we need to make sure when we're talking about this that it becomes easy and common vernacular these days to to reference issues that an individual may be having as mental health. Uh, and that's why I, I recommend, you know, that, that Dale, that, you know, an adjudication is mental disease or defect. That could be traumatic brain injury. That could be intellectual or developmental disability um, and things of that sort. And, you know, I think common day modern vernacular media, et cetera, is when someone has issues where they may behave different than quote unquote, the norm, it's mental health. Um, and I just want to caution people that what may be termed mental health isn't always mental health uh, as we define it. Uh, and that that's an important piece for us to kind of suss out in, in some of this uh, study. And that's why I think it's important to have uh, some representation from other areas like Dale uh, involved in this. Because uh, then that does get into the, the whole, uh, how do we not only sequentially intercept or, or or try to work with people to mitigate risk factors for violence in the mental health world, but in any world uh, and such. So, so I, I, I'm aware of our time, but I'd like to ask one other question. We really didn't talk about the membership of the study group per se, other than that it's large and, and it is convened by the Department of Mental Health. So I'm assuming that the Department of Health is not just convening, but participating. Um, yeah. But um, do you have any other thoughts in terms of the membership? Because I mean, I hear you saying perhaps somebody, perhaps let's assume for a minute that, that there was some way to say these, this, this part of the group should address these issues, this part, those issues, et cetera. And there's an overlap I'm sure for numbers of people. But, uh, but I, what I'm hearing is that there's at least some part of this where Dale, a representation from Dale would be in order. Yes, uh, no, I, I, I think that some representation from Dale. Um, I think, you know, uh, in here it mentions the director of healthcare reform. Um, I, I guess I would add, or designee, you know, that's an individual. And, right. you know, I think that that could become burdensome for, for one individual, depending on, on, on that. Uh, well, I think that might be true throughout. That's, I mean, I think we would re rewrite the statutory language, which often says uh, the you know, the Office of the Defender, the, the De Defender General or Designee or et cetera. So I think the, or Designee will probably be incorporated throughout so that, uh, but no. but are there other other official groups or stakeholder groups that you're thinking of at this point that we should be at least thinking about in, in crafting a revision? You know, I, I think that, you know, in, in one sense, you know, trying to keep in mind the larger of a group, the more difficult it gets to accomplish things. Yep. Um, and so, you know, I know that it mentions, you know, two crime victim representatives, um, uh, but it mentions a single person with lived experience of mental illness. Uh, and, you know, I would personally think that maybe then it's two, you know, at least, you know, something like that, yeah. uh, a person with lived experience with mental illness. Um, you know, I guess the, the piece of the of the the list that I I like and hopefully will stay is that 
any other interested parties permitted by the commissioner of mental health. Uh, mm -hmm. Then that gives us some latitude when someone says, hey, I, I think we're important for this. You, you forgot us or, you know, et cetera. We can say, oh, okay, you know, great. Uh, and uh, cause I know like the Vermont Medical Society had asked about that. And I think in particular because of Dr. Rabin's expertise and- I, I mean, frankly was thinking that. about that as we were looking at this and I didn't know whether- Yeah. And, so I know, and I know that they were they were seeking to be on that, but I, I never really put forward myself saying, suggesting that they need to be on there because I was aware of Dr. Rabin's expertise and desire. And I'm like, well, the commissioner of mental health can allow anyone else permitted. So uh, hopefully I don't get fired or, you know, something like that in the meantime. And I, you know, will follow through on my commitment to them, but you know, that, that type of thing. Um, but okay. So. But no, I think I think the members are are appropriate. Uh, I just think part of what what needs to happen is who's at which table, if you will, and when. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Other quest, quest committee members questions uh, in the next few minutes for uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox. I'm not seeing any right now. I, 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 so I would ask, and it sounds like you're, you, you've offered to be available to us as we think about crafting, uh, incorporating some of the suggestions that have been made throughout the morning. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, we'll, we'll take, that's, that's going to be part of the charge that this committee needs to take on. Uh, so we would welcome that from you. Yeah. Just let me know when and if you'd like me to come back, I believe my schedule is, although some people might not be happy with it, my schedule is flexible enough that I can, I can make, make time this afternoon. Um, well, yeah. we'll, we'll let you determine who you make unhappy. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Just let me know when you'd like me back and I will plan to be here. I'll try and answer some other emails and other work, other work that I might have to do uh, in the meantime. Actually, just a few other things. Okay, well, this has been, I think this has been an extremely uh, helpful morning. Uh, and I, I should say that there have been some others who've been in touch saying, you know, we would request being able to be heard by your committee as well. And we're going to try to figure that out. But, um, but I, but frankly, I do think this has been very helpful. Uh, and has elicited a lot of useful information and suggestions. And I want to thank each of the committee members uh, who participated in this. So I'm going to suggest I'm going to suggest that we bring this to a close for the morning. Uh, we will I, is my intention for us to return to this this afternoon as as committee discussion and um, I don't know there'll be any drafting done between now and when we come back. But I I think there there's a number of I, I've been making bunches of notes and Katie's Katie's with us. I don't know if she'll be able to be with us this afternoon. Katie, are you committed elsewhere this afternoon? Or I see Katie is here. I am here. Um, I believe I'm supposed to be in another committee this afternoon, but I will double check with them to see if they're listening to witnesses or doing markup. Okay. Does anybody consider cloning? <laughs> I would be open to it for sure. <laughs> it might be easier. Well, I don't, know what, I don't know what the process involves, so I don't want to volunteer anybody. Okay, well, uh, let's let's chat, Kate, Katie, because I think it might be helpful to have you join us if it's, if it's possible. Uh, so let's call this to a close for the morning. And again, my understanding is that the floor should be relatively short today. Uh, now, I'm, I could be proven wrong in an instant, uh, but we're going to the floor at, I believe, 1.15. And then let's plan to reconvene here like 15 minutes after the floor. Does that, does that give people enough time to transition? with the goal of returning to these issues and having committee discussion and trying to begin, you know, formulating a, a proposal.